My name is Tom Castley. I'm a librarian here at Boston University, and I'm sitting here with Kathy Castley, CEO of Creative Commons. And we're going to have a little conversation about the work that Kathy does and the work that she has uh, uh, had experience with in the past before becoming CEO of Creative Commons. So, Kathy, one of the things uh, that I think about is American life is often described as an open society. And you've, uh, your professional life has been involved with what is called open educational resources. I wonder if you could describe what you see and understand open educational resources to be, and do you see anything about that work that is uniquely American or fits into the character of American life? Mm -hmm. uh, so just to describe a little bit what open educational resources is, um, it is a way to use the internet and sharing and creativity to share knowledge across the world. So now that we have this digital age, and it really goes back to the core that knowledge is a public good and the public should have access to the public good. Um, and the idea is to really make great quality content used for teaching and learning purposes available for people throughout the globe. So while it very much began uh, within the United States because it was in, um, initiated by the Hewlett Foundation in many ways when I was a program officer there, there are many, many uh, partners who have come in who have collaborated across the globe. And I think when, we think when I think about open educational resources, it's about the core right to education. It's the core right to knowledge and access. It's a core right to equity. And that's um, a core right in the United States, but it's also something that I think, as we think about freedoms and as we think about democracy across the world, we think about uh, access of that for everyone. So the open educational resource work that you've done is uniquely tied to uh, the changes in technology and the development of the internet and what we often call the web. Right. So this was 2001. We were beginning to explore what could the Euler Foundation contribute to the education space. The web was taking off. Uh, universities, schools, K-12 systems were trying to figure out how you leveraged technology for education. And what we thought is we could begin to contribute if we could set some standards for really high quality educational content that harnesses the power of technology, that harnesses the power of artificial intelligence and learning sciences, and that also makes a very open system, so this is the open part, which really is really important, that the content can be reused, remixed, and reiterated on, and that you can take student data, understand how different learning assets work for different students, and quickly improve that cycle of learning and improvement. Is there anything particular that you would point to that somebody could take a look at or um, learn particularly more about this or come to a better understanding of it? So there's uh, many sites across the globe. They could Google um, OER or Bing OER, Open Educational Resources. There's an Open, uh, open Commons is another uh, repository that they could look at. And in the Open Courseware space, there's an Open Courseware Consortium, so particularly for higher education, which would be most appropriate for Boston University students. Um, they would be able to see courses and materials from around the globe not only from institutions who have participated here in the United States, but a consortium of international players in multiple languages as well. Great. Um, part of open educational resources is, is involved and related to open access, how, and that's a term that we use a lot as librarians. Mm -hmm. How would you describe open access? So uh, maybe going back, actually providing a bit of a frame for two things. There's the umbrella of open educational resources. And in open educational resources, assets are either in the public domain or openly licensed. And we want to be sure that they're remixable um, and reusable. Open access um, is the public having access, viewing capability to often, which is research and scholarly publications. Uh, it's journal articles. It's the books that are sometimes uh, licensed in that way. And then stepping back to my role, certainly as uh, CEO of Creative Creative Commons, Creative Commons provides the open licensing platform. So that powers open educational resources, it powers the open access movement, and these are little bit distinctions within the open space overall. But when we think about open access, we don't think necessarily about remixing um, the journal article itself, but that the public has the right to that. They can easily access it. You can find it through the Public Library of Science, as an example, and that you can take it and redistribute that um, article without having to seek permission for that. Use. that we want to promote this whole idea of remixing, repurposing. 
So um, it goes back to the creator and their choice is what we always try to define and it's the freedom. And open access, it really is just access to the journal article or to the book. I think the new space that we're all thinking about and touching is the area of big data. And in the area of big data, when you have research articles and they may be uh, the, the funds to support that research may have been publicly um, launched from NIH or National um, Science Foundation, there's now a call for that data to be put into a repository so others can reproduce, so the results are reproducible. So this then gets into a question of data as an example of you'd want, to, you want someone else to be able to pick it up and to be able to reanalyze and also to build on that primary research and actually extend it in different ways. So they might add another data set to the original data set and be able to take the primary research and extend it in some ways. So I think as we think about this space, this is all a bit new. Um, and I think it's also about what pieces make sense for which audiences. And as institutions or researchers may have a certain um, way of thinking about what's appropriate for them, I think we're also trying to think about what makes sense for um, students and for learning in general. And then I think the most important comment is we have a whole new generation of learners who have grown up in the digital age, and they are remixing, reproducing, repurposing. And this wave is coming. And so I think there's a question of how the institutions um, adapt to this wave and begin to structure um, the systems that are much more responsive, I think, to where students are and where the world is heading as we think about the industries that are out there today. So this might be a good opportunity for you to describe the work of Creative Commons and, and what it is that Creative Commons hopes to accomplish in this space. So Creative Commons was formed to make it easier for people across the world to share whatever they produce um, through the medium of the in the internet age. And so what it does is it allows, it's a legal tool, it works within the framework of the law, um, and so we provide kind of the legal tool and the technology behind it so that you as a creator can append a license, which isn't necessarily cop just full copyright or isn't in the public domain per se, but allows you to express how you, the freedom of how you want to share your content. So people around the world can take whatever the asset it is, whether you're a musician or a poet, if you're a teacher, um, and they can or create a video. And if you want the world to share, to share it and remix it, you allow them to do that. Otherwise, um, uh, it's a way of expressing your right. The organization itself is a small 25-person uh, organization in Mountain View in Silicon Valley, but we have affiliates around the globe with 70 jurisdictions, which are essentially countries. They've ported the license into their local jurisdiction so because it has to translate into the local law. We're now working actually on 4.0 of our license, which will become a global license, which won't necessarily, and we're working on this now, meet, uh, need to be ported. It's also become the global standard, and this is really important because as we think about different licenses and if you think about the world of law and contracts, what you want to do is you want to make sure there's reduced friction, and what you want to make sure is that things are interoperable. So what we're trying to make sure is as uh, not only in, in helping to create and promote the licenses of Creative Commons, we also see ourselves as stewards of the global commons. And that means to make sure that the web and the internet world is kept for free for innovation and that we make sure that um, this is a place where expressions of ideas can continue to travel throughout the globe. Do you think there are uh, threats or dangers to that kind of openness? Um, in the internet, the web, and the new world of technology that we face? I think we absolutely do believe there are threats, and I think uh, we think there are definitely, it's a fragile, fragile environment because it's new, and the regulations or non-regulations around the internet aren't quite clear as, why, as well. There's standard body organizations like World Wide Web Consortium, of which we participate in, um, and I think the biggest threat to sharing is that we create siloed repositories. And in creating silo repositories, we inadvertently, as users, don't realize that sometimes something is copyrighted and we use it because we have the medium of the internet and we think we have the right to use it. And so what we have to do is kind of teach this generation about copyright. It used to be it was only the publishers who had to worry about it, but now we're not only all consumers, we're also producers. And so the, I think the biggest threat is this issue of interoperability. And as particularly governments begin to um, think about sharing, sometimes they're setting up their own license for their own country. But that then doesn't cross boundaries. And the world is very global, and the boundary crossing is very, very important. So 
Creative Commons has an important role with all of the changes in technology and communication that are occurring around the world. And you see it as an educational role, as in addition to the role of supplying these licenses? It's an educational role about supplying, uh, educating the world and institutions about copyright. And so actually when we begin to explain Creative Commons, we have to begin and explain copyright. And we have a team of lawyers that we work with who are the legal scholars, and we have the legal scholar kind of tribe around the globe. Uh, but we have to educate people what about what copyright is, what the rights are, what the law of their land is, and then if you use a Creative Commons license, what does it mean? So if you use a new tool, you have to begin to understand it. And so that's a little bit of the services that we provide so people become more knowledgeable about it as well. You and I both have a 15-year-old nephew who is extremely creative, <laughs> who posts things on the web, on Facebook and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think he knows about copyright and his rights? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I think uh, I, I'm surprised, at, and maybe I shouldn't be, um, that the number of the younger generation, a much higher percentage, know what Creative Commons is, understand what it is. Um, and I have these conversations sometimes when I have my computer up and I have my little CC sticker on it where people bump into me into the airport and it's often the kids who understand what it is. So I think the new, the next generation uh, is beginning a certain, a much higher percentage of it knows. Uh, those who are loading um, videos to YouTube as an example, you, YouTube now uses standard term of service, but it's very easy now to also check if you want to share under Creative Commons license. So places like Flickr, which used it early on, YouTube, which uses it now, Wikipedia, which carries the Creative Commons license at the bottom of the page, people are beginning to understand. But it isn't yet in the curriculum, as an example. And just uh, to that point, we're at creating actually a school of open where we can begin to have the content for teachers and others to begin to educate their students and have some tools for them for their classrooms. So I think what you're asking is, how does Creative Commons fit into this environment and become best practice or the standard of practice? Right. So as we really think about sharing on the internet, we have large social media platforms and new ones are coming up all the time and we can only imagine which ones... Pinterest, will, Instagram, internet, right. it goes on and on. We'll be here, what will be the hot ones in two years, three years, or which ones will have the long stability in the, in the social media space. And the challenge for us is to think about how we become part of that ecosystem early on. So as all these young startups are starting, they're thinking about copyright now, and that there's a pretty frictionless way for them to integrate the Creative Commons license. And what we have is a bit of a subset of those uh, groups that understand um, the issues around copyright and are worrying early, and others who are just pushing hard to get their product out pretty quickly. And once a product's out, it's actually hard to change some of the norms and practices. Um, and just as an example of that, there was a, there's a small startup in Palo Alto that just kind of got through the firewalls and called me last week. Um, and they're trying to think hard about copyright because they have user-generated content. And they're getting calls from their users saying, what about the Creative Commons license? So to me, these are all uh, some symbols and symbolic that the signal around sharing is growing. People are beginning to understand it more and more, and that platforms will need to adjust. But we're very much still trying to integrate into these kind of these platforms. And when we do more and more, I think that's where we'll really under, be, begin to improve the understanding. So this means that uh, somebody, new people looking at this new technology, are actually looking at that little box that we often check called terms of use or more information. Right. And should we be looking at that? And what should we be looking for when we use all these different services? Yeah, I mean, I think what we know is that we're all signing up for all sorts of things and we're all clicking the terms of service. And if you even dig down into it, it's 24, 25 pages and you need to be a lawyer to really understand <laughs> what that means. Um, and, and, and it's a complicated world. And in many ways, what Creative Commons did is we simplified the world of copyright with our little CC icon. So you see the co see copyright sy symbol, you know you have to respect copyright. Right, and we, we work within that frame. But if you see the CC symbol, it's now becoming a norm that you understand that sharing is all right, right? So how do we begin to simplify the terms of service so the user who's clicking can understand very readily how either the data is being used, how the information being generated from their use of the site. And right now that's very opaque, very hard for anyone to really understand that. And I think that's actually something that's going to be changing in the space. Um, and I think there should, there'll be organizations who will be helping the customer and the end user do that. And that could be, some, in some ways, um, a role that CC begins to play. So you see that CC that, you, that one recognizes. It's almost like a, uh, uh, 
It has a brand value, an That's identification brand. value. Exactly. So it's the brand value. People who know the brand know what it is. It's not uh, permeated everywhere, certainly, but those who are uh, using the internet a lot, the bloggers, they all know it, and they cannot even imagine when I talk about the rest of the world and trying to get into the mainstream because that's so much of their space. And just as an example, I was at um, the Night News Challenge at MIT in, in March, and everyone in that world knew Creative Commons. People on the panels were talking about Creative Commons. I didn't need to be even there promoting Creative Commons. In that world, Creative Commons is the part of the fabric. Right, but there's so many other parts of our society and institutions that it hasn't yet permeated because they're not as embedded in sharing on the internet and those who are on a regular basis have come to know that as a symbol. Um, I think the, the key issue is how libraries evolve in this digital age and now that distribution, just as you described, you know, the cost of distribution begins to approach zero as we have, once we have the asset digitized. What does it mean and where should the firewalls be? Um, I think is part of the question. So I think the biggest question for institutions, and this goes for when I speak to corporations as well, is we think about what value we bring and contribute to society. Institutions like BU contribute bringing these incredible young students together who sit with professors in classroom, who sit with their classmates, and access the library resources as part of their building of knowledge. And at the end they get a certification, they get a BU degree, which is what they take forth and symbolizes what they've collected here. But in that process, there's all these assets here at Boston University that serve these students, but if you were actually to open them up to the rest of the world, it wouldn't detract from your core mission, but it would actually expand the larger mission of sharing knowledge with the, with the greater good. Um, and so I think there's a few pieces on that in particular for libraries in the digital age. One is around scholarship. One is around access. One is perhaps creating open uh, repositories where faculty begin to put their materials that are re readily accessible not only for the BU community but also to others outside where they're very they're curated, they can be easily searched and found. And then the other piece on that is how libraries begin to think about this open data space and this is all brand new. I think libraries are going to play a very significant role and libraries particularly in their role of promoting scholarship and research uh, the ability to have open access journals, the ability to um, have repositories where faculty can put their data and student can access data will be really important as it goes ahead as well. Um, one of the things that is often pointed to in this environment is uh, the role of uh, certification, as you call it, for mm -hmm. a BU student. Mm -hmm. Those people teaching the students have a certification process to call tenure. That's right. And that is often seen as uh, a bit of an impediment because mm -hmm. uh, in that process they need to follow standards that came about prior to the internet, mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. kind of openness of the internet. Ha have you had any experience in, in talking or dealing with that, that aspect of it with, for example, uh, a person who's studying hard, working very diligently to produce good scholarship, wants that scholarship to go to a uh, a certain journal or a certain mm -hmm. uh, community and that community may not have these same standards of openness. Right, so I think that's where we're seeing the growth and change and I think it has to come from both sides. It's the young faculty who are promoting new methods and it's also institutions that have to begin to um, identify other um, criteria by which to evaluate the performance. So let me give you a clear example. Uh, when I was in London there was someone from Mendeley Mendeley is a great online repository for scientists. And what it was, it was scientists, and this often happens that the, their peer, peer and colleagues aren't always at the same institution. They tend to be at other institutions, either right. within the city or across the country or even across the world. And the internet now allows that kind of collaboration to happen. So it was actually became like an open sharing site for young uh, faculty member in the sciences. And what they realized is that there's now new metrics in new ways to measure the contribution uh, for young scholars. And so it isn't necessarily just the peer-reviewed journal, which takes a long time from start to finish and then access to the public. And then if we think about the time frame, the innovation that happens beyond that, but that if they can begin to show their ideas earlier and share those ideas, they can also accelerate their own personal learning and growth, and others can pick up and build on them pretty rapidly. But the only, went, the only time they'll be able to do that within the current structures is if they're rewarded for actually doing that. So some of the things that this organization Mendeley is using is collecting different data 
uh, from that site about who is um, calling up good ideas, who's picking it up, who's downloading the early kind of research papers, even if they're in more draft form, um, where are our ideas and energy concentrating. And so you begin to understand who has some of these really gem and key breakstone ideas, but it happens in a different point in the process. And those metrics actually are now being picked up by um, administrations of, of universities across the globe. And they're looking and they actually pay a fee to this open access site so that they can have access to those metrics and they use those metrics to evaluate their scholars. So I think what we're seeing is a whole transition in the process and I think this has been part of the, um, the barrier and so I think uh, there has to be both enough upswelling of demand and I think in the end it always has to be we shouldn't be doing things because it's the way we've always done them. We should be doing things because it makes sense for now and now that we have new technologies and platforms I think we have to think about what are the right and appropriate tools to assess scholarship and research and because of these times uh, I think we need to uh, broaden the swath of what we look at. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Kathy very much for her time, and uh, it's been an enjoyable and an interesting conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Tom.